We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we haven't had a race in three weeks, but holy crap, has so much stuff happened. So much. Honestly, it's been... A welcome break with my chaos at work, but it's also like super uncomfy because I'm like, wait, what? What's going on? There's no race. We just had no races, and now we have no races again. I don't like all these breaks. Yeah, the way the calendar was scheduled this year, obviously summer break is a thing we have to have. But then we had two races. Then we had a three week break. Then we had two more races. Now we had a three week break, and now we're going into the final triple header of the season. But like, it's so back and forth and back and forth and just especially this break was I feel like was weirder because of all of the news that came out and there's just been so much that's happened over which is these why last we're doing this episode early right right instead of looping this in with the Vegas predictions because if not the Vegas predictions would be like a three-hour episode and we're both kind of tired I had a busy weekend and you have a busy life so we figured we'd just carve this out yeah, and I love how we always approach it of like, oh, maybe we'll do an episode if there's any news. And we're always like, meh, meh. And I literally DM'd Catherine and was like, is F1 okay? <laughs> what is going on? It felt, it felt like last week, because this is Monday as of, we're recording. Last week, it felt like boom, boom, boom. Just like left hook, right hook, back and forth with all of the news coming out. So yeah, I feel like this is the first break this year where there's actually been news. Yeah, especially like thinking like this episode is, is very similar to what we did in winter break to lead into this season where every week we had new news and new more new news and Lewis Hamilton breaking silly season news and Ugh. more and more news. So yeah, this it's it's just it's been so much. It's been a lot. It's been a yeah. lot. So I think we should get into it. But before we do, for those of you watching us on YouTube, I just want to have you all be graced with my presence that is my new sweatshirt. So this is a big stepping stone for me. I am now officially Team Williams Racing. I will now be the Ferrari and Williams fan of the podcast. Um, but you guys know how much I love my sweatshirts. I wear a different sweatshirt every episode. But this is a new one that I just got actually today, and I'm so excited. If you are just listening to us as a podcast, it says Williams Racing across the entirety of this men's extra large sweatshirt. So it can be yours if you go to Abercrombie and order it. Um, I love Not sponsored, but they should. Not sponsored, but they should be based on how much I wear their McLaren and Williams sweatshirt now. Um, but they're just killing it with like the F1 merch. They have a ton more McLaren stuff. They have a ton of Williams stuff like t-shirts. I love sweatshirts. So I got the sweatshirts, but, um, go check it out. Highly suggest. I'm going to have to look into that. You should. Honestly, I was like, should I get Catherine something for Hanukkah from Abercrombie? But then I was like, "Mm, it's not Red Bull. As as soon as they license with Red Bull, I'm filling your... Your G- game on. Well, I can't say I'm filling your stocking, but I will. I don't. I don't know what we 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 just. I'll we just don't really have a stocking. stocking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, there and one of these days I will get you your Toto Wolf coffee mug My with Toto the Wolf coffee epic mug. quote from 2021. Which, skipping ahead to the second bit of our news, obviously, if you remember, if you were around Formula One in 2021, specifically Abu Dhabi. Um, This is this quote, no, no, Michael, this is so not right, is to former race director Michael Massey, who made a decision in um, Abu Dhabi 2021 that had a heavy hand in Lewis Hamilton not winning his his eighth world championship. He was replaced by two race directors that following season, um, one of whom was Niels Vidic, who had taken over the main uh, duties as race director, I believe, in 2023. Um, And... He was fired, except he, they said that he wasn't, except then he came out and said that he was and that he didn't resign. So it's been a whole heaping helping of awkward with the FIA lately. Yeah. So this is point one for our news update. I just find it interesting, the timing of this. Like, this is what I don't understand 
about F1, we get news constantly throughout the season of, like, people leaving teams, which I get. Like, it happens in every single sport. But F1 is just, there's so much that goes into a season. Like, what's the difference between firing him when there's, like, three races left? Like, I just don't understand. Like, what's the point? Especially when his job is very important. Like, the race director is the one who's in charge of starting the race, first and foremost. He pushes the button that makes the lights go off. And other things... I mean, how hard is it to push a button? (laughs) I mean, yes, but he's also the person who, like, determines when to send out the safety car, what flag to show, whether it's, like, a red flag or yellow flags. Like, so many things go into the duties of race director. It's not like we can rock up and say, hey, we're the new race director, you know, with with no notice. And to... I mean, maybe we could. (laughs) But... From considering how much, you know, Michael Massey was not a very favorable figure amongst the FIA from teams before, you know, 2021 happened. And Fittich was not like, he wasn't like the worst. Um, they, they, But then you're right. The timing is weird, especially going into Vegas this weekend, because Vegas is a massive undertaking of a race, especially considering half of the race is on the strip in Vegas, which gets opened up during the day. So is this like the right time for the FIA, especially to let him go? Because that's what happened. He did not just decide to wake up and resign. He was like on a way to a meeting in Geneva when he got word. And now they're bringing in a guy who has experience with F2 and F3 race direction um, in Rui Marquez. But going into Vegas, really? After everything that happened last year? I know. It just doesn't make sense. And I feel like we haven't had issues in races this year to where it would be like oh he needs to go yeah now I I will argue Red Bull may see that differently after this last race with like or whatever race it was where they two races two races ago thank you (laughs) this three-week break is really throwing me um but yeah when they didn't pull the safety car soon enough whatever but it's not something so monumental to where I would think "Mm, he needs to be fired right like there were some questions uh from people specifically George Russell who is the head of the drivers association of you know how you know especially thinking about Sao Paulo like how the conditions were and were the conditions actually safe enough for them to to be in cars racing whether it was during qualifying or during the the race itself so there were some questions but Nothing that you would think that would lead to this, except for the statement that the Grand Prix Drivers Association released during this break. And if you missed it, um, the Grand Prix uh, Drivers Association created an Instagram account that was followed by all of the drivers. And they released a statement basically commenting on the let's call it the curse word gate and how Max Verstappen and Charles Leclerc were both treated very differently for, you know, saying the, you know, my, my, one of my favorite words that starts with F in the FIA official press conference. And Max was given, you know, community service and told that he needs to be a better human being. And Charles Leclerc was patted on the head and said, give me $10,000, $5,000. It was something absurd. But the statement basically said, we are grown men and we should be treated as such. And it really did imply that there were people around Formula One, specifically FIA president Mohammed Ben Salam, allegedly, is one of the types of people who has kind of been treating the drivers like children. And it's also, from what I've read, it seems that Niels Vidic has another one of those people who allegedly could have been, you know, a little demeaning to the drivers. And that's what they implied in the language of their statement. Yeah, but like, okay, I understand what the drivers are saying, but also like grow up. Like, I, don't I mean, know. everybody needs to, to grow up, but the, the thing that I think is happening or that people think is happening here that wouldn't surprise me is Mohammed Ben Salim, the FIA president, kind of put Vidic on the chopping block as a smoke screen to kind of try to do away with the whole scandal and try to be like, okay, we got rid of this guy who we know that you don't like because he treats you like children. Now we're going to move on and, you know, go forward. And it's, 
Right, but I just want, like, I understand that because he just doesn't want to lose his job, so he'll just throw anyone under the bus. But for this whole, like, driver statement thing, like, I understand what they're saying. They're like, hey, we're all adults in this room. Like, let's all act like it. But you have, like, broadcasting rules and laws and regulations. Maybe not laws, but rules and regulations, especially in the U.S. Like, you can't say the F word. Like, you cannot say that on live broadcasted TV. I did that once by accident. (laughs) And if broadcast, like... And if the FIA is going to, like, they should just have a standard penalty of what happens to drivers who, you know, break the rules. But you can't just go around dropping F-bombs and talking to a live audience that's being broadcast worldwide how you would talk to anybody on the street. Like, you just can't do that. And I think them saying, like, treat us better. It's like, no, follow the rules. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. NBA and the NFL, they all have fines for swear. If you swear, it's a set fine. Great. FIA model it, like do something. I think it's the willy nilly of it. Of like, Oh, some people get this and some people get this because they that's, apologize. That's, that's, that's the that's issue is the, is the lack of consistency and, and the fact that, well, you that's know, a different issue of being asked to be like treated like an adult. It's just like, where's the consistency? But there's literally no consistency in the FIA whatsoever. So I which don't we think have, we're going to get which it. Which exactly is what we have seen lately, especially with all of the penalties that Max Verstappen got in, what was that? Mexico? Mexico. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the, it's, it's the continuing adventures of the, you know, F1 and Formula One versus the FIA. And I mean, we've even had it, you know, years ago, and I think we talked about this in our Braun documentary episode, how, you know, Formula One did kind of make an attempt to break away from the FIA world championship, you know, yeah. years ago that just didn't pan out. And because of what was happening with Braun and it's a whole thing, watch, watch the documentary, l- listen to our episode, watch our episode. But the point is, is the FIA axing their race director with three races to go in the season is it's a so dumb, dumb move. And especially thinking about how Vegas went last year and just how much of a challenge it was to get to the Grand Prix itself. Cause the race was a good race, but to get there, it was not so great. And it was kind of a, you know, a madhouse and you need somebody who has experience with that. And to get rid of the guy with the experience is, is a bad idea. Yeah. Speaking of getting rid of people with experience. Uh, yes. So, Kick Sauber, whatever we want to go by this week, team, um, has come out. And Gabriel Bordoletto is going to be their second driver next season. So he will be taking the second seat with Hulk going into 2025. Remember, this team then turns into Audi. Yeah. So, okay. I, I don't know. I, I get it. I I also don't at the same time. Like, I'm very excited to see another rookie. We haven't seen rookies in a few, in like, what, two seasons? Because and now we're going to have so many. And now we're going to have so many. It's going to be absolute chaos. I just know something bad's going to happen next year. Um, again, the podcast that only talks about the future. But for me, it's it's an interesting pick. I Like, it was in line with one of the ones we thought. We knew it wouldn't be Joe, which is really unfortunate because I really wanted him to stay on track. And we thought it would be Botas, and they would just keep him around for one more season until they get into the Audi era. But I think it's interesting bringing in a rookie to a team that's, like, not going to be around. I just feel like this is setting him up for failure. It, it really... Obviously, we know that the the Sauber this year is awful, and the Sauber slash Alfa Romeo has done significant amounts of damage to, I mean, the end of Kimi Raikkonen's career, the beginning of Zhou Guanyu's career, and the this current quote unquote sunset of Valtteri Bottas's career. So, this it hasn't been good, and next year is probably going to be another season where Hulk and Bordoletto are probably going to be fighting for P19. So it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be ugly again. And the hope is that, you know, everything that goes into Audi and the new regulation will kind of even the playing field for all of the teams and give them an opportunity to bring a better car. And obviously they're going to try to bring a better car next year as well. But 
But will they? <laughs> Wait, but will they? It, it'll it'll be really interesting. Obviously, they're going to have the most wind tunnel time because they currently have none points. But it's it's great to have Bortoletto coming in. You know, he. I wouldn't say he's probably going to be the F2 champion. There's two race weekends to go, which means that there's going to be four races left between Qatar and Abu Dhabi. And he's only up four and a half points over Red Bull driver, Isaac Hadjar. So he's been leading the the championship for a while in F2. How well will that translate to F1 though? And that's something that we've talked about at ad nauseum is how prepared is he actually to be in an F1 car and to be in a bad F1 car? Obviously, Ali Behrman is coming in with experience in a good F1 car and a mediocre F1 car. And Kimi Antonelli is going to be coming into one of the better, you know, F1 cars, give or take how Lewis Hamilton feels about how, how the car is from week to week. But I, I really don't know how this is going to go for him. I don't either. And I don't, I honestly don't think that F2 is the predictor of F1. Like, great, you're the champion. But, I mean, look at Logan Sargent, right? He finished, what, uh, P2, P3? Fourth? Okay, still, that's pretty in, high. In, pretty in, high up. He finished, yes. yeah, P4 in an F2 season, and he got one point by default his entire one-and-a-half-year career. Like, I just don't think it's a predictor. I don't think it's a good feeder circuit but we've talked at nauseum about that it's the only feeder we have you're right but... exactly exactly so it'll be interesting to see what he does he's done a lot of testing so you know we'll see yeah and and he is a highly regarded mclaren you know junior driver which he is he until I believe the end of the season, he will still be a mclaren junior member but zach brown was happy to let him go because he's good but they have lando and oscar so they don't really need they they don't have a need for him right now so might as well you know send him down to to sauber but yeah i i don't know it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see how how it pans out for him and also how it pans out for botas and joe the rumors are that they're gonna be reserve driving so we'll see i yeah, so the flip side of this is obviously two drivers are losing their seat with Sauber. Allegedly, Botox is moving back to Mercedes to become a reserve driver, and Joe is going to move to Ferrari to be a reserve driver. Now, the Botox thing, I think, is actually factual, just based on the incredibly emotional Instagram posted by Nick Schumacher, who's yeah. currently a Mercedes reserve driver. Makes me think that he's losing his spot as a reserve driver. Um, which Yeah, the, the door is kind so of closing sad. on on Mick Schumacher's F, F1 career, which is is incredibly unfortunate. But if Botas wants to be a reserve driver for Mercedes, Toto's got to, he'd be crazy to, to say no. Yeah, I don't know. I think they were doing a lot with Mick, and I know that Mick has done a lot of work in the sim and helping the team with development so it's just it's sad to see those years and like his hard work go to go for nothing but like there were so many seats open this season and Mick didn't get any he of was them. also he was also in the mix for for Alpine oh. Audi could have wanted to go double German drivers so it's it's well, and really even Williams could have grabbed him instead of Colapinto but they didn't so yeah but for you know Schumacher, he does still have a great relationship with Alpine. He's still one of their endurance drivers. He will probably continue driving with them. So he's still going to be driving in motorsport. He just won't be in F1 for probably ever. But who knows? He's still young-ish, I think. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how old these drivers are. It's Honestly, he looks like he's 12. And they all seem exactly. like they're, you know, of that elk. But speaking of Alpine... So news came out, Renault is no longer going to be a engine supplier. So Alpine then was left without an engine supplier. In 2026, they will be moving to Mercedes. This isn't a big ta-da. It's not a surprise at all. No, we had had talked about how this was going to be most likely the move that they would make. I think it's the only move to make. I mean, we we know, we, we, we have seen for years that the Renault power unit just hasn't been good. That's that's why Red Bull jumped ship at the beginning yeah. of the drive to survive era. So this 
this is the the only choice. And I mean, it's worked out real well for McLaren. So why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that also came out. I think the coolest thing to be announced over this break is the F1's big kickoff event that they're doing in London. So if you live under a rock, hmm. you may have missed this. Next season is the 75th like official season and they're kicking it off with a big massive event where everyone's doing a livery reveal all at once so if you followed along with Catherine and I at the beginning of the season we had our live left livery episode that we kind of went through all of them but it took us a long time to get there I think it was announced over like what a, a month almost uh it was like it was about three three two and a half three weeks yeah it yeah was, it, so was it was a, a lot of time. a long time this year middle of February, every single team is doing a reveal at the same time, which I think is super, super cool. Everyone's going to be there. I'm sure it's going to be a big ta-da. Um, I'm sure they'll be promoting Drive to Survive because Drive to Survive will come out like that next week. Yeah. So I'm excited. I it's, it's going to be... watch it, but I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be really cool. It's on February 18th at 8 p.m. GMT time, which I think will be like early afternoon it'll be after lunch for me and it will be Emily is working time for Emily but it's this has been a kind of wild weekend regarding it because tickets went on sale on the 15th so last Friday and sold out like within 45 minutes and then a bunch of tickets hit up um, on these resale websites for like significantly more because the ticket prices I wouldn't necessarily say that they they were reasonable, but I think that they were attainable for most people. If they really wanted to go, they were between like 50, you know, 60 pounds and 120 pounds, but they, they got snatched up quick. Obviously O2 arena is only a 20,000 seat arena. And that doesn't even count, you know, how they're going to set up staging. So it. It was a little bit dramatic. Everyone had to put out a statement saying, you know, tickets on these resale websites may not be legit. So your ticket might not be honored. So be careful when you're purchasing tickets, which is kind of wild. And it kind of reminds me of like when Taylor Swift's Eras Towards tickets went on sale and everyone was going crazy Ugh, through Ticketmaster. Don't remind me. Yeah, I'm sure it was awful. Um, yeah, because I was doing it in South America. <laughs> Also that. And it's like, if you belong to this random small bank, you will get pre-sale. Everybody else will not get tickets. Yeah. Um, anyways. But yeah, I mean, this is just another thing where it's like, I wish I lived in Europe because they have like the cool F1 pop-ups all the time in Europe. I know they have them occasionally in the US, but all of the good stuff happens. In Europe. In Europe. So, rip. Yeah, but I'm really, I'm really excited for this. There, there's going to be so much for like the 75th season of F1 that I think this is the the right decision think, to start things off with deliveries. I think before the season starts, we have to do like a high low of how many times they bring up that it's the 75th season. Oh, of so F1. many times. <laughs> That's I'm all that it's going like to be. Five hundred. Uh, especially so oh, at least. Sky Sports presenters, I'm sure they'll say it like a million times, but anyways. It'll it'll be part of the, the racing script. But yeah, I think it, it'll be interesting. Of course, Max Verstappen, who found out about this while he was in the middle of like live streaming oh a God. sim race, was just like, yeah, I hope I'm ill that day. But we all know that like Max <sighs> loves the F1 pageantry so much that that man just wants to drive the car. That's all I he wants to do. I love how much he hates his job. Like, yes, he likes driving, but he hates everything else that has to do with it. Like, he doesn't even do their testing, right? Like, Checo or the reserve driver does the testing. He doesn't do any testing. He just sims, races on a sim team, and drives the actual car. Like, that's literally all he does. He hates every other aspect of his job. I'm pretty sure if it was, like, more PR versus driving, he would just not be part of F1. And maybe that's oh, when absolutely. he's going to retire. But. He he will retire very very young, but it's also kind of like like Kimi Raikkonen. Also, like he had to have his arm twisted to do like any media duties unless they were like fun media duties that like he was interested in. Like he just like wouldn't want to do it. He'd be like, I could be taking a nap right now, and he would yeah. say that. 
Yeah. Love we it. We miss Kimi Raikkonen. Though his son, Robin Raikkonen, has been tearing it up in the karting world and is I going know. to be like the next, you know, big thing since sliced bread once he gets to the, you know, upper series when he gets a little bit older. So that is something that like the motorsport world is keeping an eye on what Kimi Raikkonen's son is going to be doing over the next few years. So that'll be really interesting. God, I can't wait until he's like a track dad. <laughs> oh my god that's gonna be so funny right yeah uh well feeding into our next story which if you know f1 you understand the connection monaco right <laughs> so it came out that monaco has re-upped their uh contract with f1 so they are staying on the calendar through 2031 now so that's exciting but the something else that's cool that's happening is that not next year because everything's already set but the following year um in 2026 it's actually moving weekends, so it's going to be the first weekend of June, allegedly to avoid the clash of Indy 500 and Monaco happening in the same weekend. Well, that's um, one of the one of the reasons, but I think the the. I wouldn't call this the bigger reason because you know people do like the opportunity to watch you know the Monaco the the jewel of Formula One the Monaco Grand Prix, which is you know a a you know, hour and a half of, of no overtakes and the Indy 500, which is, you know, one of the biggest motorsport events in the United States back to back. But this move, moving Monaco to a week later, will allow the Canadian Grand Prix to finally make sense on the calendar, which is yes. most important. So they are piggybacking with Miami. So we will have Miami in Canada and we will no longer have this like random break between European races, which... I was reading an article and someone's like, well, we all know that Canada's our reprieve from Europe. I'm like, oh, did we? I'm like, no, it's a random scheduling error that you guys are trying to cover up with like this weird excuse of, oh yeah, everyone knows we're taking a break and going all the way back to Canada. Yeah. <sighs> and we all know that Miami has to be in the beginning of the season because of football season, because it does go around the hard rock, which is where the dolphins play so they can't have that during the football season which also the other two american races are in you know in football season so we just don't we don't need that well i mean it would make sense to like do all of asia all of the u.s and then all of europe i think that's kind of where they're trying to go with with their strategy um, of doing the regionalization, but just logistically with American football season, some of that's just not attainable, so. Right, exactly. So next year will be the weird random, we're gonna be in Europe and then we're gonna go to Canada for a weekend and then we're gonna go back to Europe and then they will fix it for 2026. So there's a lot of stuff that's like, we're fixing it for the new regulation. Yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, I think honestly, it's just going to be a whole new ball game in 2026. Audi will be there. We have new regulations. We have a schedule that kind of makes a lot more sense. So cooking with well, gas in 2026. And another thing that, that it looks like Formula One is leading to, which is something that I predicted like months ago, is that they're going to kind of have like a, a rotating mix of tracks that are going to be on the calendar so it won't be the same set of races every year like so when we go to asia you know one year it'll be a couple different you know locations in asia then it'll be a couple you know a bunch it won't be like are they two actually Italian. moving to that i don't know if they're actually moving to it but it looks like they are because every other week we hear of another race that needs to be added back to the calendar turkey wants to come back south korea wants to come back i want sepang to come back uh you know lewis hamilton wants africa to come back we onto all the calendar. Want africa to come back everyone wants africa to come back onto the calendar so, but in order to do that you need to have room on the calendar and that's why my idea which i'm sure it's not only my idea of regionalizing the regions would also make sense so that you could have a different mix and give other people in other locations your opportunities to attend formula one races and have other tracks and obviously it's not going to be really easy because monaco just you know has a, a new contract till 2031 so they're not going to let you in 2028 say we're going to take a break from monaco not that formula one's going to take a break from monaco even though it's not the best race but remember the 2026 cars will be smaller so that might actually help with overtaking yeah well and i also think 
it could change the entire landscape of F1 if we do like, because if you really split it up, right, and you do Asia and Australia, and then you do the Americas, and then you do like Europe and potentially South Africa, like you could have race, 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 nice break, race, 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 nice break, race, 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 instead of us having like one race, three weeks, two races, two weeks. You know, and I, I understand they're humans and they need to, you know, not die from a, just travel race. Because triple race, headers travel are race. hard. They're very hard. But if you regionalize it more to where the travel in between races is like an hour or two flight or like, I understand Brazil is really far south. So say like six, seven hours, but you're not like 14 hours here, 12 hours here, 10 hours here, 13 hours here. Like that is easier on your body just doing smaller trips. But I also think it would be better for the fan experience as well to where we don't have these like fake summer breaks because the summer break really is only three weeks and we've had like what four three week breaks this year so far like that's uh, a lot yeah yeah we have so if they, you, they, like, this calendar has been those weird random, and we didn't even lose a race exactly we didn't have the you know china last year but like if you really do it to where maybe you have you know, your Asia races, and then you have five weeks, and then you have your America's races, and then you have five weeks, and then you have Europe as the grand finale. I just think that would make more sense. But well, we it would want to be the Middle East to have the grand finale because of all the oil money that's coming into Formula One. And the well, that's washing, fine. You can, that's... You, like, that's part of that area. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I see what you mean. I do think that that's where Formula One is, is going to have to go, especially if they want to keep adding locations, because, you know, conceivably, you can really only have 24 races in a season because the season is a year long. Like, I don't see any of the drivers going for more than that. And I, I just no. don't see, like, logistically Formula One being able to do more than that. I mean, this this season has even been a lot for us. And we're not even traveling. Right. And I mean, I, I truly think it's it's quality over quantity, right? Like, I'd be fine with 20 <laughs> races as long as they're 20 good races. Like, I don't need Monza. We don't need Imola. That's, no, I'm you, sorry. We, I need Monza. Need, I don't need We need Imola. Monza. Oh, I'm sorry. Tifosi, don't yell at me. I love you. Um, No, like, I don't need Imola. Yeah. I, there's... There's not any others I'm willing to part with at this moment, but I could be swayed. I, I mean, there there have been a couple this year that like were not bangers, and obviously, like not every race in the tw- in in the entire Formula One calendar is going to be a banger. Like we know that. But... Like I don't love Miami. No, I mean I could we bring back the Phoenix Grand Prix in the middle of downtown Phoenix over Miami. I mean that would also probably be similarly as awful, and driving through downtown Phoenix is a nightmare anyway but we we could we as americans can live without miami we have vegas we have i think we as americans like would have been fine with just having coda honestly i don't just vegas absolutely not is it just a big spectacle for f1 to do f1 things absolutely absolutely miami is like the same thing lots of money lots of big pull lots of publicity totally understand that in a mediocre race on a poorly formed track the design exactly Thank you. So I'm fine with keeping Coda and that's it. Like, I don't need Miami. I honestly don't need Vegas. Shoot me, but whatever. I mean, Vegas probably is not going to be long for Formula One. I really feel like the city of Las Vegas doesn't want Formula One to come in because no, I think they did how it one long year, it like, takes. So this was fun and we're done. Yeah, like e- even if you think about when they did Vegas in, in the 80s in the Caesars Palace parking lot, like – that was bad enough and now you've moved vegas to the middle of like it's it's you're driving on the strip and all around these hotels that you know the the hotels themselves a bunch of them are also losing money because of like you know grandstands that block the view and blah 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 so it's it's i don't i don't see vegas being too long for the formula one calendar beyond what the current contract is which i don't even know what the current contract is because i don't think anyone really cares but i i just it's going to be interesting to see how the f1 calendar evolves going into these next few years and i think that these next few years of contract extensions will really be telling of how that's going to go because 
And obviously Monaco is going to have a long extension because Monaco is like the race in Formula One. Whether it's a as good race or bad don't is like it. They won't take Monaco off the schedule. You just can't. Like you no. because of the history, you can't have a season without Monaco. Exactly. Like it, it just it doesn't make sense for the sport to get rid of it, even if it's not the greatest of races because you can't overtake easily. Except that you can, you just don't overtake much at the front. Because if you actually look at how many overtakes there are, are more than it looks like. They're just yeah, not I mean, where everyone thinks they are. That's like golf taking away the Masters and saying, like, oh, we're just not going to do it. No, because screw you know Augusta. I mean? Yeah. Okay. So several more points here we want to just kind of quickly touch on. Um, I don't really have thoughts or feels on any of them. That's but... why I put them here in the bottom. But here they are. So, kind of a big thing. So, Liberty Media, we've talked about them several times, owns F1. Boom. So, they have a president and CEO, nice man named Greg Maffey, and he is stepping down. Um, he's going to serve as a senior advisor in the transition. And then John Malone, who's currently a chairman, is going to take over the role in the interim. Um Maybe this is a good thing. I don't know. Change can either bring good or bad, but... Liberty Media's purchase of Formula One has skyrocketed Formula One to where it is now. So, obviously, this guy did something very good and very important to to the sport. And he's stepping down because... Liberty Media is going to be kind of adjusting their leadership structure. And this is the end of his contract. He's been there 20 years. He's like, I'm over it. I'm done. And so it's it's not really... I don't think this is going to be very significant. Obviously, you know, a couple of years ago, there was thoughts of like, would F1 be sold because their valuation is so much higher? But I don't think that Liberty Media would be dumb enough to get rid of Formula One. No. So really, this is just the continuing evolution of moving forward within the the landscape that we're in. And I don't see, you know, I don't see the ownership of Formula One changing hands. Also, there's some movement at Aston Martin. So Dan Fallows is currently their technical director, but obviously with the much anticipated move with Adrian Newey's move to Aston Martin next year, which we're all very excited for, um, Dan Fallows is kind of out, doesn't really have a role. So he will be staying on with the organization in a new capacity, which means he will be Excuse staying on until I he finds another roll. job somewhere else. Right? Excuse like, me while I eye roll. This is like an under the table discussion with Daddy Lawrence of like, hey man, so we got the goat coming in and like, yeah, we don't you gotta go. You, but we'll give you some pay until you find another place to land. Right, um, it, exactly. Which, I mean, there's like, there's basically, what, 10 jobs for 14 people in the entire span of Formula One. So he'll probably end up at another team somewhere else once he like fully leaves Aston Martin. So this is like the continuing adventures of the, the you know, staffing Formula One merry-go-rounds, which... It's musical chairs. Exactly. When will the music stop? <laughs> Well, the music did stop in Quebec, where the statue of Gilles, Gilles Villeneuve got stolen. Very, very famous Formula One driver. His son was also a Formula One driver who also got married in Vegas as Jacques Villeneuve, who was one of my least favorite Sky Sports commentators. But uh, it was it was cut off at the ankles and, and stolen, and that's just rude. Yeah, and that was it, was, big news. it was like... They really wanted to take this thing because they just sawed him off at the ankles and like the feet are just sitting there. So interesting. But yeah. Uh, also, speaking of Sky Sports presenters, Damon Hill is leaving Sky Sports after 13 years, which he's he's not my favorite, but he's also not my least favorite. Right. Um, he's kind of honestly. Let's call him the Pierre Gasly of sports co- <laughs> Sky Sports presenters. <laughs> yes, that makes sense to us. Um, we hope it us. makes sense to you too. If you listen enough, you understand. So I'm just curious of who they're going to replace him with. That's that's my immediately what I thought of was like, oh, sad, but who's going to be his replacement? Yeah, um, it's, it's, or maybe it's, they who- won't, and it's more just like they have like rotating people or they or have maybe they... they give bernie collins more to do exactly i was gonna that's, say maybe they give goal. someone else a bigger spotlight so hopefully it's bernie because we love her yes and 
unfortunately, it is not Miley's favorite Sky Sports commentator who's leaving, and they keep giving him things to do, and I just think that they need to stop. And if you know who, if you haven't figured out who my least favorite Sky Sports you commentator is already, attention. you really <laughs> haven't been paying attention, and you should because I I make digs at him without saying his name many times, but. <sighs> I don't take as big of an issue with him, but there are some races where I'm like, shut up. I just, <laughs> when I decide that I don't like someone, I like go full on of like the, the vendetta, whether you know it or not, is there, which is very much my personality. So <laughs> same, Checo. <laughs> Checo. <laughs> which Checo is still a Red Bull driver that has not changed over these last few weeks. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go completely off track here. And I okay. just want to talk to you about this for a second because I keep seeing stuff pop up where it's like, no, Checo is staying hard stop, shut up. And it's like, I feel like this is a PR stunt because then we have Christian Horner asking about Colapinto and they're talking about their reserve driver, Isaac, on how he's like great and he's going to be doing a bunch of testing for them. So off the cuff and just throwing this at you, what is your percentage of like Checo will actually be in the seat for the full season next year? I think it's about 60-40. I, or against. I, 60 that he stays. It should be 60 that he goes, but I think it's 60 that he stays. I Because I feel like everything that I've been seeing in this, you know, break since the last race has been, he's staying. Here's why he has to stay. He's going. Here's why he has to go. He's staying. Here's why he has to stay. And it's just been going back and forth. Like that's the only thing that I've, I've been seeing other than the news that we've been talking about is, is the back and forth of like Red Bull has to keep him. No, Red Bull has to get rid of him. Here's why. And like, here are the options and, you know, or no, Franco Colapito can't go to Red Bull. It would destroy his career. Max would ruin him, etc. cetera. Ad nauseum, like Checo's the best person to drive with, with, with Max, whatever. So I think based on what we have seen before and what we have seen all year long with Red Bull and their backing of Checo is 60% he's actually going to stay. I think Helmut Marco said this week, like, oh, you know, we're going to wait until after Abu Dhabi and we'll figure all this out. So because Helmut Marco keeps saying things, but also Helmut Marco doesn't like Checo. Allegedly. Does anyone like Checo? Mexico. Um, (laughs) Mexico. Um, Okay, so here's my next question. So say he stays and he starts the season. How many races of poor performance will it take for them to replace him? That's a great question. Like, that well, I, do you thought, think... I thought we had seen this year of getting rid of him at the summer right? break and it didn't happen. So I, and and obviously what we have murder the... did he witness for him well, to no, still be in the no, seat? No, we, we know that the alleged reason why he still has the seat is because of his, his, sponsors. his sponsorship backing. Cause he does bring in a crap ton of money to Red Bull in sponsorship I money to you. They go to Mercado Libre for, if they want Colapinto, Mercado Libre will pay anything that they need to get him out of it. Don't well, know where but, they'll get the money, but they'll get it and but it'll that's, completely that's cover the it. the thing. There is this rumor that his financial backers are making up for the amount of money Red Bull has lost by the fact that they are probably not going to win the driver's championship and they are currently in P3. And so that... The, they're allegedly ponying up to provide That's Red Bull with so the prize money. Dumb. Right. And this is a, this is like tens of million dollars in prize money from P1 to P3 where they are now. So that's allegedly one of the reasons why Checo is still here. Oh, speaking of Vegas, I am now seeing the commercial for Vegas uh, on my on my television because I am watching the very bad Monday Night Football game. But anyway, the answer is... I don't know. The problem is Checo should be really good. He brings in a lot of money, but he's bringing in a lot of money and not being really good. And and what is going to have to give for Red Bull is something that we have not seen what the, the, the linchpin is going to be for him, actually getting rid of him. Part of me hopes, not, oh, this is, that sounds terrible. Part of me would be curious to see what would happen if, say, Checo gets sick. Say he had the appendicitis, right? (laughs) And they throw Isaac into the car. Say they throw him in there. 
I bet he would do a lot better than Checo, but would that be like, you know, the final straw that broke the camel's back? Or would they just be like, oh uh, no, it, you know, put Checo back in the car. You know what I well, mean? Well, here's, you know? here's, like, here's what the... is it, what's going to take them. Oh, I just can't. I think if the he answer makes is it through the next season. I'm just going to keep but, interrupting you. If I mean, he I makes know. it through next season. You're going to be pissed. I'm going to, no, I won't be pissed. I'll be like, Confused, baffled. Confused because out the wazoo. Here's here's the other thing. It's it really is about money. I saw somewhere that Helmut Marco gave one of the money other talks. Red Bulls what Red Bull Junior drivers a Yumu Uwasa a task. He's currently driving in the Japanese uh, version of Formula One Super Formula, and basically said you need to improve your social media platform. Like you need to be bigger on social media because Checo and I know you love Checo's social media so much, but Checo does have a big uh, platform and he has a lot of big sponsors. Kit Kat, who is now a partner of Formula One, uh, Disney Plus, it, you know all all of those you know Mexican telecoms, etc. So the answer is. Who is a driver that is going to bring in lots of money and also lots of talent? Because I and that's Franco another Cole question. Pinto. Like <laughs> Franco Colpinto is is one of the guys who is raking it in sponsorship wise right now. I don't really know what the status of like Leon Lawson sponsorships are right now. Obviously, Le- you know Leon Lawson is driving for V Carb in that second seat at V Carb. Will probably be in that seat next year, but Red Bull is not going to decide on that until the end of the season, and that is the last seat to go. But it's it's really a question of of where can Red Bull find a driver that's going to be talented and bring in money. And Checo is technically very talented. He just hasn't been showing how talented he is. I mean, this is the guy who did finish P2 in the in the championship last year and then just has gone down the toilet ever since. I've just been really stuck on the comment that Helmut Marco told another driver to make his social media better. Has he had that conversation with Checo? Because I cringe and I'm uncomfortable in every single ad that he does. But he has ads, whereas Awasa doesn't really have much by way of like that. I don't know how Checo still has ads because he can't. There's no way he's selling anything. Because he's like literally one of the biggest (laughs) names in sports in In Mexico. Mexico, I understand. I mean, I, I know you. I know you know this, but like that's that's the thing is this is also about how much money you can bring in. One of the reasons why Logan Sargent made it to Formula One is because his family is wealthy. Nicholas Latifi, money. Michael Schumacher brought in a ton of money. He, I mean, he was also a paid driver. He just turned out to be one of the best drivers in the history of Formula One and have massive financial backing. So a lot of what we forget about Formula One is, is the money. money aspect. Yeah, because, like, Lando's dad has a lot of money, and Zhou Guan Yu brought a ton of money from China. So, exactly, yeah. and know, it's like, and, and, you know, one of the most talented drivers that's not on the grid, he's one of their reserve drivers, Teo Porcher, he has no hope of making it to Formula One, because, yes, he's very talented, but he has no financial backing, and that has really been one of the things that has screwed him the basically ever since he left the, the the lower series like there's been no place for him because yes he's good but he doesn't have the money alongside it yeah that's the one thing about f1 is like the haves and the have-nots yeah which is why any other sport like yeah you need money for like equipment and training and whatever but you can make it even if you're poor exactly as like talent drives you where this is like money is the the one of the bigger factors so anyways yes I just wanted to go completely off track because I was curious through all of this news of like the back and forth of where you sat and what you thought so yeah the the back and forth honestly about the you know the Red Bull seats has kind of been one of the exhausting parts of this weird little break we've been living in fall break part two but yeah but one of the fun things that we did here that came out today is the f1 academy 2025 calendar has been released we've got seven more weekends starts in china ends in vegas and i think it's gonna be cool there's three um there's gonna be three new tracks on on the calendar for the f1 academy the f1 academy um, seats. They've started to announce who who's going to be in in what seat. I think we'll get a few more announcements once we get closer to Qatar because there's going to be a lot of of 
F1 Academy drivers who are graduating out of the Academy. Yeah. So we'll have a lot of them coming in. I'm still waiting on somebody to announce that Nina Gaidman is coming. She was the wild card driver in Zanvoort who like stunned everyone and everyone's she like, Susie needs it. to get her a seat immediately. So really excited to, to see her. The um, one of the the other wild card drivers, she just got a seat. I don't remember where it was. We'll cover that once we get closer She's to F1 English, Academy. Right? She's English. She drove in Singapore. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So so the one from um, from Singapore's wild card. She will be on the academy full time next year. It's I think F1 Academy keeps growing. It's really really cool. I'm still a little dissatisfied by the fact that we only get seven weekends out of them, but they're at some it's a tracks process, this year. Catherine. It's a process. We can't I know. Jump I'm just from zero to a thousand, so we'll get there. Yeah, but so I'm impatient. Said, we will have seven weekends next year, so it'll be China, Saudi Arabia, Miami, Canada, Zanvoort, Singapore, and then ending in Vegas. So I think those are great races. Um, it is, you know, too bad that we don't have more, but I think they're spread out enough in this season uh, to where we still get our F1 Academy fix, so... Yeah, I think I think it's good. I think that they picked a really great championship weekend to end on with Agreed. with you know going to Vegas this year. They're ending in Abu Dhabi with the rest of the the F one season. And if you're not going to end in Abu Dhabi, you might as well end in Vegas. So I think right. I think and it I works. kind of like the idea that they're separating it because you can't really celebrate the end of the season when F one has like this big looming shadow over you of like right. we're F one, you're just F one Academy. So I think it's smart that they end earlier in the season because they have less races and also kind of out of the, sh the shadows and in their own spotlight. So I approve. Yeah, right. Next year, only F1 and F2 will be ending in Abu Dhabi. So F3 will have ended earlier. F3 is, this year is already uh, wrapped up. And then F1 Academy will also be ending in Abu Dhabi this year. We have two more races, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. So we'll see. All right. So holy heck, that was a lot of news to catch up on, but we're doing you all a favor because if we did this and then Vegas, we would never get off and it would be a three hour podcast like Catherine said. So up next, we will have Vegas predictions episode that will be out on Thursday. So a little earlier, maybe uh, we've kind of been, it's been a, a variety wait. this year. I think that Thursday is also the same day that racing starts because, um, Vegas. Yeah, we did Vegas. this last year too. Yeah, so so it will be when what day? Is it? I'm bad at time, and where is my calendar app? Um, here we go. Yes, so practices start on Thursday. Our episode will be out on Thursday as well, and I will also be in the middle of a volleyball match during. No. Yes, I will be in the middle of a volleyball match during FP1. FP2 is at 11 o'clock at night for me. Vegas, I forget that like, the timing in Vegas is so weird. It's better because than last year. We're accommodating everyone in We're Europe, accommodating Catherine. Europe, yeah. So, like, the race starts for me. It Race starts for you at midnight. Race starts at, for, for me at 11 o'clock. Race doesn't start for me at all. Oh, right, <laughs> except it doesn't start for you at all because you are going to be on a deserted island. <laughs> not deserted but yeah so i will not be recording deserted. our prediction episode but then i am going on hiatus for 12 days so Catherine will have some fun guest hosts to do our recap from vegas and then do all of Qatar because i'm missing it so yeah so you will not see me or hear from me for a while but i will be on our vegas prediction episode which will come out thursday so that'll be out thursday morning and then Free practices will start in the afternoon so evening or evening but yes depending on where you are depending on who's being accommodated um but yeah so that Definitely is it is. I don't even know what this episode is I think we're just calling this the winter break recap but we can't because we have a winter break and like I I month. think that the episode title that you came up with is if is formula one okay is formula is... one okay <laughs> Because I don't to, know. <laughs> welcome to our hour-long episode of contemplating if F1 is okay. Um, That's I'm, what this has been. And I'm we don't still know. still TBD. <laughs> so. <laughs> nah, yeah. So, yeah. cool. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in a few days. Thanks for coming. More to come. <laughs>